Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, we're coming right up to 3.45. There are still people joining, um, but we better make a start because there's a lot to get through, um, I think. And obviously, I think there are going to be quite a lot of questions as well. So to welcome you uh, formally, I'm just going to introduce Gemma and Kat. My name's Alex, Alex Yates. I'm the head teacher at the Royal Free Hospital Children's School in North London. Um, it's in the London Borough of Camden. We're a community special school. Um, we offer quite diverse provision across uh, his four sites, um, which includes a kind of hospital school, uh, an eating disorders uh, unit, three alternative provision programs, which is the bit that you're going to be more interested in today, I think, um, in that they all are kind of united by addressing issues around emotionally based school avoidance. Um, we have been working around something that we call a challenge model. And I did speak, I did do an ACAM event a couple of years ago with an ed educational psychologist called Sarah Cryer, where we talked about the kind of approaches that we were taking and, and, and sort of starting to finesse and found that worked with this kind of target group, which obviously is a very diverse target group. It isn't one type of child or type of need. Um, and I think Gemma and Kat will hopefully capture that in their talk today. Just very brief background to um, the program that they're going to specifically talk about, which is an intervention we developed called Linked Up. Um, that first came about during the COVID lockdowns. We had the closure of the, the wards at the Royal Free Hospital in North London, where which is, which is where we provide support to the paediatric service there. We were looking at having some spare capacity and a senior teacher called Mike Kelly came up with the idea initially. We ran a pilot in autumn 2020. Um, there was enough in it in terms of impact we felt and success that um, Gemma, who you're going to meet today, then picked it up. Um, Kat, Ari, our educational psychologist attached to the school, then worked alongside Gemma, and that's what they're going to talk about today. So I think they're going to do some general background about the kind of approaches to that might work, um, or you might have more success with around emotionally based school avoidance, and then specifically around a, an, in, an intervention which we think is quite innovative. We are certainly looking at making it sustainable now. Um, and we've not had a cease and desist letter from uh, LinkedIn, which is great. So we can carry on using the name uh, so far. Um, so I'm going to hand straight over. So we've got maximize our time here. I'm going to suggest that you put any questions in the q and I don't think we'll get to all of them, but I think if they're in the Q&A, they can be passed on to Gemma and Kat. Um, we're happy to you know, answer what we can ourselves here and now if you want more information on the school everything's on our website um we're always happy to help within reason um and i noticed there's quite a lot of um, international guests today again please do get in touch we're always happy to um to to learn from each other and support so without further ado i will hand over to Gemma and Kat who are going to lead you through the talk today and then we're going to come back i'll probably be quite strict and stop it around 20 to 5. So we've got 15, 20 minutes of quality question time. If you two finish earlier than that, that's fine. We can we can start the Q&A then. So away we go. Thanks, Alex. I suppose it'd be helpful if me and Gemma introduced ourselves first. So I'm uh, Kat Halligan. I am an educational psychologist currently in Camden and soon to be next week in Redbridge in London. And I am the EP for the Royal Free Hospital School. So that's how I came to be involved in the work that we're going to talk about today. And I also do quite a lot of work in the borough around emotionally based school avoidance as well. Yep. So hi, I am Gemma. I work at the Royal Free Hospital Children's School with Alex and with Kat. Um, I held a number of different roles there and the safeguard lead. I work with the eating disorder service to uh, coordinate school liaison for the young people who are out of education because of receiving treatment. I work on the pediatric wards. Um, I coordinate this program um, also. Okay. So are we gonna share, share my screen? 
So just like um, Alex said, so linked up essentially is uh, an intervention to look at re-engaging young people back into education, okay, after this, uh, whether it be a short or a prolonged period of absence, um, thinking about looking at what are the challenges involved as to why they are not attending. Um, so it's it's a program that looks at both the sort of the psychology aspect, but also the practicalities of making the links between home, young person and school. So today what we're gonna think about in, in at overall aims. Okay, so if we thought about in its sort of, uh, in its most simplest form, the overall aim of Linked Up was sort of a, a two pronged was to think about how we can support schools and then how we can also support young people. So in regards specifically to schools, we thought about um, in specialist alternative provision, you know, perhaps the thinking is that, you know, we, we have more resources, we have more time, et cetera, which it, to some degree perhaps may, may seem the case. However, um, it's linking really with our mainstream practitioners where we've wanted to try and think about how we could support them with our specialist knowledge about how to get them back into school, particularly after the COVID lockdowns that we all experienced. So again, wanting to work with school leaders and teachers to prevent what we call these sort of behaviors and this avoidance becoming entrenched. And for our young people, we want to engage them back into, you know, a love of learning, a lifelong love of learning and education. Um, thinking about, you know, what progress in that transition might look like to get them back into school and, more than anything discussing that elephant in the room which is what sort of naming and identifying those thoughts and feelings about um, what is preventing them from doing so and coming together to think about a school plan thinking about practical small gradual steps and strategies to support them back to re-engage I would add a third thing now, post having done a cycle and a half, as well to do with families and parents and engagement, because as you'll hopefully, um, you know, hear as we go along, parents and engagement and the holding of them in this process has been particularly successful also. Okay, so just like Alex said, the development of the program. So, um, this was sort of a reaction uh, uh, to, to, to our COVID experience. Um, Mike Kelly, one of our teachers at the Royal Free School, this was sort of his brainchild. Um, and in that summer, he curated a, a, a two week program, um, which again was online, which incorporated specialist input from our Royal Free teachers in the subjects of um, art, music, drama therapy, English, and then one special specialist area of his, which is the development of the sort of thinking, helpful, unhelpful thinking. Um, so the sessions were to, to be delivered during Zoom, okay, uh, which was the, you know, the common platform of which we were all using at that time. And ideally, it was to try and begin to triangulate reconnection with school, the young person, and again, education. So the big question that we asked ourselves in sort of the lessons um, post the, that first cycle as a staff team, and at this point we didn't have EP input from, um, from CAT. So we, we sat together as a role free staff. We thought about, you know, what were the positives um, and, you know, what's next? And the big question was, would we be able to reach young people that we didn't know and encourage them to get back into education through this online platform? Because as we all experience trying to engage young people, some some flourished in that environment and others really found it a struggle to communicate through the screen. 
okay? And, and essentially dropped out for the period and missed education during, during that time. So in thinking about what that might look like, um, we, we reframed things and we thought about what does that look like after the program finished? And could we involve um, the education psychologist, um, psychology service within Camden to support us to do that? And that's really when CAT steps in. Yeah. So the follow up support was what we kind of brought in for the second kind of pilot, post COVID pilot, um, that may be thinking that that support beyond the two weeks is actually linking back up with the mainstream school is actually really, really crucial. And that's definitely what we found. Um, so it's about kind of, for some children it might be about thinking about alternative pathways or alternative pathways to support that maybe aren't their mainstream school, but definitely not in all cases. And in most, I'd say most the interaction we're having is mainly with the mainstream school, the school that they've come from, the home school and working and parents and working out a plan for how to get them back. Um, Offering that emotional support for parents as well, because that's something, as Gemma was saying, that Gemma does a lot of as part of this program. And it's really, really crucial because often when children are struggling to come in, it's and they're they're struggling to leave the house, it's their parents as well that also end up being really caught in those um very anxious cycles. And then the was to support in that follow-up support with some very graduated return to school sort of steps in very small steps and that's something I'll talk about a lot today in terms of helping children get back to school but just as part of you know alongside while the linked up program was sort of in its formulation we also in Camden were creating guidance around emotionally based school avoidance which is the term that we decided to use so I tend to use school avoidance or struggling to attend school rather than refusal or defiance or truancy, because all of those words make it sound like it's the young person themselves that's just saying, nah, I don't want to do that. And it's not like that at all. It's actually that there is a real difficulty with going to school for an, uh, for an emotional reason that hasn't been met and those needs haven't been met and we need to work out what they are. So that's why we use the term school avoidance, because it's actually a real difficulty with stepping into school and, and pretty much all of the time, intense anxiety around going to school for different reasons. And we need to recognize that as an emotional need. It's a symptom of an emotional need. So the guidance you can find online, if you type in um, Camden Emotionally Based School Avoidance Guidance, you'll find it online, actually through the Royal Freeze um, website, where we cover things like definitions and terminology, indicators for EBSA and when to kind of intervene, some risk and resilience factors, how to seek information, um, strategies that people at home might want to use and school might want to use, and the kind of approach to returning. And we also have a specific kind of pathway within Camden that we use, which is which is covered at the end. So if you want to get some more information about EBSA, then that is a good place to have a look. So the psychology underneath the program is drawn from the psychology in understanding emotionally based school avoidance. So there are some key kind of key things that we've incorporated into the program that I always focus on um, when I'm thinking about when I'm working individually with a child who's struggling to attend school or as part of linked up. So the key thing is to work out what are the push and pull factors that are contributing to EBSA. I'll go through these a bit more in a minute. But what are the things that are pushing them away from school and pulling them towards staying at home? And what are the things that might be little pull factors into school? Maybe they like one subject in particular. Maybe they've got one friend. Maybe they've got one good relationship with one adult at school. What are the little things that we can use to kind of pull them into school? With school avoidance, especially when children have been avoiding school and haven't been attending for a long time, Often through these push and pull factors that we identify, we then have to create quite bespoke intervention plans. Now, there are general kind of um, concepts, and principles to keep in mind when you're supporting children who avoid school. But often for the ones where it's very entrenched, we do need to come up with a bit more of an individualized plan for them based on the push and pull factors that we identify. And that needs to be planned as much as possible with everybody 
And this year on linked up the second kind of main cycle that we've done, those plans have been made with family and school, but also especially with the young people themselves. And I think that's where you're going to get the most buy in because they're part of the plans that are being created for them. And they're telling us what they think they can do and what they think they might need. Um, as part of the linked up program, we also incorporate psychoeducation. So teaching about anxiety and strategies to cope with feelings of anxiety. So I do, and I'll show you later, a couple of sessions as part of the program about, um, about managing anxiety, about where anxiety comes from, about survival responses, and about fight, flight, freeze. And I get the children to start to think about some of their own thoughts and some of the things that are contributing to their feelings of anxiety around school. And then I'd say kind of like these the last three bullet points are your overarching principles when you're supporting somebody who's struggling with school attendance. So the first thing is psychological safety. And by that, I mean predictability, consistency, familiarity, similarity, things being the same, things being routine. I think we often think in school that because we have a timetable, we're giving children quite a lot of information. But children that are so worried about going into school, they need to know exactly what's going to happen. Who's going to be there? How long are they going to be there for? Who's going to be with them? Are they going to see other children from their year group if they struggle to do that? Where are they going to be sitting? What are they going to be expected to do? All of those things, you need to tell them in advance and you need to plan in advance to make things as predictable as possible. So psychological safety is really important and that's really a big part of the plans that we make. Then the second kind of key element in supporting EBSA is about relationships and nurturing relationships. And that's between all of the teachers on the linked up program um, for parents, for students, for staff in mainstream schools or in the home school. It's about creating those relationships. We need to identify somebody in the home school who that child has a relationship with or can build a relationship with because it is the relationship that will get them in on that day when they're really, really anxious. So that's a really important factor. And then lastly, I use quite a lot of cognitive behavioral psychology in the sessions with young people and in the kind of, you know, how I'm thinking about, um, about young people when we're making plans. But the key thing is that the plans have to be gradual and they have to be step by step. They can't be all in one go. If we think about ourselves as adults, if we're quite anxious or worried about doing something, say we've got something sort of really big that we have to do the next day, we're really worried about going into work or something the next day. If we think about the whole day, the whole thing that we have to do, that's really overwhelming. We're better off thinking about just the first step, just the next step, just the next step. So I talk loads about laddering and that we have to move children up the ladder very slowly. And sometimes an error that schools, parents and children themselves make is to put themselves too high up the ladder so the jump is too big. They, we need to bring it down and make it smaller because every time you prove to yourself you can do it, you're more likely to do it again. So that's very much a part of the psychology that underpins the programme, the follow-up and the initial programme that we've put together, but also generally for working with and experiencing EBSA outside of this programme. I said um, earlier about push and pull factors, so I just want to like roughly show you where that comes from. It comes from some research around kind of school avoidance, and it's that when risks become greater than resilience, that's when we might see school avoidance. And it's actually the environmental factors that are really important to get a young person back to school. So what we've created in Camden and what I use as part of this program, and here's an example, um, is a push and pull grid that looks like this, which you find in the guidance. And we map out the factors. And in the sessions with children, I get them to think about the factors. So this is an example, some of the things that often come up. We think about those risk factors, what's pushing them away from school, but then also those resilience factors, what might be pulling them in. And this grid is adapted for West Sussex's um, EBSA guidance, as a lot of our guidances, and we've cited them, them in there. But this is the one that we use in Camden. So I just kind of ask you to maybe think about with some of the young people that you're working with or that you know what kind of factors you see. There are some that are really common, some that are quite niche, but there's always push and pull factors. And it's a really important stage. It's the first stage of intervention, identifying them. So I want to um, give you a little bit more detail in terms of how the linked up program organizationally works, because behind the scenes of all of this and coordinating it, it's very um, it, it's actually 
quite time consuming in order to, to, to put all the parts together. So in total, if we think of a timeline and I have a flow chart, which is quite detailed that I think can be made available to you is I, I've sort of done a bit of a, 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 if you imagine a term's worth of work and if you break it down week by week and if everything goes according to plan as things always do, it looks around a 17, 18 week intervention, okay? So it, it's quite labor intensive to front end it, but once that bit is done, it's, it's, it moves quite seamlessly. So it's, you've got week one, which essentially is about, you know, someone coordinating the project, i.e. myself. And within that, you are um, eliciting schools to think about, um, you know, introducing, I introduced what the program was about, told them the kinds of aims. Um, very important to, to put forward up front really was, you know, our commitment to you and really your commitment, i.e. school to us, because it really does involve a huge commitment and time from the school in order to have the best outcomes, to have that consistent coming back. And I'll explain how that works now. Also at that meeting and what we've adopted um, since is our service level agreement, which essentially is, is, is that written contract between us working together. So within that, afterwards, there is a series of referral paperwork. Now, the referral paperwork is really interesting. And the reason that we ask it, it's the we use the type of templates that we would at the Royal Free School when we would have a, a referral of a young person to any of our alternative provisions or smaller provisions. And that paperwork asks school to think about, well, to, to give us attendance um, data first and foremost, to think about um, the sort of the psychological well-being of the young person. Are there any pre, you know, predisposed learning difficulties or special special educational needs and disabilities we need to think about, neurodiversities, diagnoses or educational reports that would be relative or helpful to us. Thinking about, you know, questions around curriculum, learning issues, social, emotional, personal uh, friendships, how they interact with others, and how, generally how they're presenting when they have been at school. We also ask school to think about letting us know what protective factors that this young person is, is, is coming from. Is home a real pulling, you know, thinking about what Kat's talking about, pushing and pulling factors so that we can start to begin to think about what we would think of as a formulation of how does this young person make sense? Because what we're not focusing on is the problem, but we're thinking, how does this young person experience the world of which they're currently living in right now, okay? So the paperwork, although again, you know, time consuming, it's a really important part. And we ask that schools fill this out with some level of detail as much as they can. Okay, so I ask schools to give me two weeks. I give them two weeks and then I say, okay, week three, and I set a deadline. Now, deadlines are really important in this intervention because otherwise you could be delaying and delaying and delaying. And this is part of reinforcing the level of school commitment. Because when coordinating, um, five to up to 10 young people, professional teams, t busy teachers in mainstream schools, parents and ourselves and our own you know, jobs, it's really important that we stick to those deadlines. And that's pretty much a non-negotiable, okay? So then we get to week five and we're sort of, this is the week before the online program begins. Um, I collected a, 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 a resource pack. I think there's a slide on it from a forward yeah. cat. I don't know if you want to jump to that. So here's In... your timeline. Oh, here we go. Okay. And the pack. Yeah. So, so inside this pack, a little cute Royal Free School backpack, um, are all of the resources that the young people will need throughout the duration of the course. They get a little pencil case with stationery, watercolor paints, paint, um, uh, uh, special art, um, what am I looking for, sketchbook, um, 
the English resources, a whiteboard, pen, paper, um, the well-being pack uh, materials that Kat will be doing with them with her two sessions, and the thinking card mats that will be um, used as well. Okay. Now, this is to create a sense of, you know, that I'm going to school, I've got my backpack, and I'm being thought of on that way. And what's been interesting is that the response of parents receiving these packs through the mail is like, oh, that's, that's, it's something special and unique to them. Okay, so it's their part of something again. So once the packs are sent out in week six and seven, then the online program begins. OK, so that's five days a week. We have an a.m. session and a p.m. session for up to an hour and a half, although you may not use that length of time. OK, that's quite an intense amount of time for a young person to be engaging after not having been on the screen, uh, you know, in school or in an activity with that rigor of routine. Um, and we, we appreciate that. At the beginning uh, of every session, at the end of the day, we do an emotional check-in with them to see what their levels of, um, are using our EBS scale of anxiety to see where they're at and check in throughout and they can send me messages throughout those sessions, okay? On that program, we've got week one and week two. We have an English session, two drama therapy, two thinking card session, one for helpful and one for unhelpful thinking, two EP sessions with Kat directly. We have about three or four music sessions with our music, um, music specialist. We have a art teacher this year. They did six, Leo, he did six sessions, three times a week, a science session. So it's jam-packed program. Now, these sessions are not delivered to, to be these sort of differentiated lessons. The young people in, in our cohort ranged from, uh, mainly from about year eight to, to, to year 10. So there were essentially, to, to capture the interest of his science. It's really cool. You can do lots of cool experiments. It was kitchen science with, with our science teacher, Steve. And, and it was to just spark that interest and remind them what it was that, you know, what they could be, be um, missing in school, okay? So the very last session is a, is a celebration. We invite schools to come, we invite parents to come, Kat, our head teacher Alex to join, everyone who's a, the key teacher who's attached. And, and we celebrate what we've done. I take some you know, pictures, I show some of the work that they've done. They curate a piece of music with Matt that we play. This year was very interesting. It had quite the heavy metal theme. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a sort of a recognition. And it, so that meeting that then we sort of end and then I we explain what happens next. Now, what happens next is phase two of the intervention. OK, so we have the planning, preparing, then we have the two weeks and now begins follow up. And this is really where we get down to the nitty gritty. This is really where we drill down with all the people and give the attention to these, uh, to, to, to making these plans, checking on them, holding everybody to account in this process and, and looking for what I keep referring to as, you know, look for the wins, okay? Look for the wins, whether that's one foot in the school gate or, or, or not. So. Originally, we thought about having two follow-ups, but it was really clear to Kat and I, after two, it wasn't enough. So we extended the follow-up work and had four sessions. So the week immediately after the online program finished, we met together, we set our first plan. And just like Kat was talking, it's a bit, I think it was a bit more in detail about the ladder and setting those goals, those SMART targets. Then two weeks would pass. And within those two weeks, what I would do is I would call each of the parents and carers individually and just check in with them and say, how's it going? And what I found myself hearing from parents was this holding space of hearing their, um, their, their, judgment or their feelings of I'm not doing enough or their worry or, or they, they would more and more were reaching out to me to help them to, to during this process. So 
by the time we got to the second follow-up, I had an understanding of what was going on and, you know, in the background, I was communicating that with Kat and then we reviewed until we got to, to where we are. Okay, so and that was, so if you think about that 17, 17 weeks, it's almost a term, it's a long time. And we celebrate those wins and we change the goals and the parameters of the ladder. And that's the sort of structure of, of, of how the program works. Oh, okay, seems within the referral. So like I said, the referral paperwork is really, really important. Um, and there were some themes, and this is what, again, was interesting. Um, we tried to capture and think about data and feedback. And, you know, if I did done some reading around, you know, EBSA, um, there's various different, you know, uh, academic essays that have been published more recently about different contexts of, of, of this, this, you know, nationwide, all right? The popularity of this webinar alone suggests that, you know, it's absolutely on the agenda. Within our referrals, we had 10 places, okay? Three of the places um, were never actually taken up. All right, those three young people, but there were much more complex um, uh, situations individually with those young people. So when I talk about these percentages and these numbers, that's where the number 10 is coming from. So the average of attendance of all of them was around 39 so 40 percent. OK, the three main themes that kept coming up, OK, for the reasons why young people weren't attending, Firstly, they would be struggling to um, access uh, the academic work, the learning, the level of learning, either having missed a lot or, or perhaps, you know, there were um, sort of, uh, I'm not going to use the word diagnosed, but, uh, you know, learning needs that needed a bit more attention. The second one was the physical environment in which these young people, overwhelming, remember having a, you know, if you think about the transition from our primary young people during that COVID time into busy secondary schools, just the natural environment of a busy mainstream inner city or otherwise school is overwhelming for some young people. And then the third one, which again, keeps coming up, maintaining and managing friends, friendship groups, and relationships at school. And this also to some degree includes sort of interactions with teachers and key teachers as well, again, as a bit of a pulling factor, because in the absence of being able to have that daily lunchtime hangout and, and, and seeing them again from being home during lockdowns at these key points of their educational journey, um, they, they missed all that social interaction and those social skills. And it was, felt really tricky to maintain those bonds through the screen. So more specifically, if we think about areas of commonality, every young person had anxiety as a core baseline um, uh, on, on, the, on the referral. Um, SEMH, uh, social and emotional mental health was an area of concern. Three of the 10 had um, support with early help services. Two, had, two young people had already been um, put on a timetable that had been tried by schools. Four of them were expressing, you know, there were concerns around their relationships with their parents. And two of the young people sadly had attempted to take their own lives on more than one occasion. So we have quite a range of um, some young people who may present as more, uh, you know, sort of a not typical, typical, but tip, you know, anxiety. And then we had some young people who were presenting with a formulation that was much more complex. Um, and that's where we had to think a little bit more creatively within our expertise at the Royal Free School and with CAT about alternative signposting and other types of services to build the team around this child in a wider way. So I just wanted to give you a bit of an example of, um, I spoke a bit about the kind of 
theory that I use in the so first of all in the sessions that the two sessions that we had during the two week program and then also I talked about the follow up as well but these were some of the things that we that we did in the um in the sessions during the two weeks so obviously everything's online everything that we do is online because everybody's coming from all different places um and you know for a lot of a lot of the young people we were doing this with they they engaged much better to begin with over the screen because they were able to stay in their homes so it worked really well for them um so I had to think really carefully about how we did it all online and how we kind of did like psychoeducation but on an online platform so I used Mentimeter quite a lot which was quite good everybody's kind of feedback um I focused a lot on like positives and success and you know one of the nice things is that as the two weeks went on they had more things to say um, so I think a lot of parents kind of fed back after the two weeks before we got into the follow up work was just that it was just really nice to see them engaging with something again and feeling a bit happier and a bit more successful and more positive about themselves. So, you know, in the psychology that I practice generally, I'm all about finding the strengths and all about successes and things that we can be pleased with. So I always start there. Um, like I said, I did some psychoeducation around anxiety and where anxiety comes from. So I taught the children the flipping the lid analogy, which some of you may have heard of. Um, but it's a fantastic analogy to explain what happens in our brains when we feel threatened and stressed and that our sort of uh, thinking logical brain goes offline and we're completely ruled by our amygdala or our big emotions brain and that bit of our brain can only do fight flight and freeze and it helps the young people to make the connection that some of their that they you know they identify themselves that I think I use the flight response when I don't go to school and they're identifying that that's something that's happening in their brain because they feel really stressed and really triggered um, and threatened so teaching that is a really helpful I know we've got quite a few parents on the on the session today so teaching this this analogy is a really, really helpful one for children to understand that our behaviours come from our sort of from what our brains are doing. Um, I use approaches and cognitive behavioural um, psychology as well. So we look at the link between thoughts, feelings, and behaviours, and that it is our thoughts, maybe negative thoughts like "I can't do this," "I can't do any of the work," "Nobody likes me," "Everybody's laughing at me," and um, to kind of to help us understand that it's our thoughts that are leading to our behaviors. And then I spoke about the ladder. So um, in the session, we think about what's the most stressful part of school. So for some children, it might be going into a maths lesson. For some, it might be going into the canteen at lunchtime. And then what's the least down at the bottom? So the least might be doing online schoolwork, or um, for some, it might be going to a certain subject or working in the library, or um, for some, it's actually going in at break time. Break time's fine. It's the lessons themselves that they find really hard. It gives us an idea of a starting point. As we always, like I said, we always start on the ladder. If we're finding it too challenging, we step it back a step on the ladder. And for some young people, the first step might be going to one lesson or going to two lessons or going and working in the library. But for some, it might not be. And we're going to show some examples. But for some, it might just be engaging with more work at home and more connection with school at home. And that's another step on the ladder. For some, it might be physically going and picking some work up from school and actually stepping foot on the premises and doing the work at home. That's a step up the ladder. And it does require schools, I think, to be quite creative it requires additional effort and 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 kind of a really bespoke approach. And we really appreciate that. So when the schools do put these things in, it's fantastic because we do know how hard it is and how much effort has to go into it. But it requires a different way of thinking about education. It's not about coming to lessons five days a week for every single lesson because that's not going to happen. But it's also not about going, well, you can only come, you won't you only come in on Monday and Tuesday because that's way too big a mountain. So we need to think about the smaller steps. And that's the only way I think if we, we need to start to think about education a little bit differently, if we're going to get some of these young people who have not been attending for a very long time or who have stopped attending completely recently, if we're going to get them back in. We need to think about engagement and education in sometimes a bit of a different way. We need to think about it using this ladder. So Gemma, I'll let you talk about um, some of these kind of outcomes from the, the first, the two weeks, the online program. Okay, so um, in, in this 
cycle, if we think about the pilot pilot scheme with, with Mike and then in this sort of extended cycle with, with the follow-up, we didn't really know what to expect, if I'm honest with you. We were sort of, um, we, we knew of the 10 to have six, that was really good. They attended regularly, okay? When, so every time a young person would sign on or not sign, if they weren't in the room within 30 minutes or so, I would send a message to the attendance officer at school or by the end of the two weeks, phone the parent directly myself and say, are they on? Are you having troubles connecting, et cetera? Um, and, you know, from, from the numbers of the, you know, it was, it was really good that we had different models. So some young people had, um, you know, a hybrid model of doing half the day at school for the AM session and would do linked up via, you know, from the school site. Others would then, you know, do, do it in the afternoon at home or do the whole thing at home. And they were asking permission to do this off their own backs because they didn't want to miss a session. Oh, I've got to go in and pick up some work for my teacher. Can I do it in school? Of course you can. Yeah. So the idea that nothing was off the table with being creative and permission to do these things was really, really important throughout. OK. Permission to take small steps and whatever that looks like to them, permission to ask for a hybrid model. You know what I mean? It, nothing was off the table in that way. And that sort of built up a sense of trust between us, I think throughout the online program for sure. Now, mostly, you know, like us, we don't want to put our cameras on. We understand that, right? Um, turn to your partner and tell them, sometimes you don't want to do that. That's that's how it is with, with young people. So. We didn't see any, uh, to this day, I still don't know what any of these young people look like at all, but I could tell you, you know, a lot about them, who they are and how they see the world. Um, but it didn't matter that I didn't see their faces. And that, again, I think it spoke something to us as well. So one thing that they did do was um, they communicated via the chat. Um, particularly in some sessions, the thinking card sessions and the sessions with CAT, it enlisted a platform really in those contexts specific to those sessions where it was a more private conversation. And they would send, you know, CAT, you, you private messages about your feelings and order, you know, in a way where they weren't exposed, it was anonymous. And again, that, that sort of psychological safety was being built up between us and them in the room. Um, it was interesting because two young people in that cohort knew, knew each other unbeknown to themselves. And they, you know, it was, you know, what I mean, there was sort of a light bulb moment. But again, it didn't affect how the program uh, and how each of them performed on, on, the, on the course either. So we had chat, we had private chat, we had the emojis, those were popular as well. Um, they did, in the art sessions, they, they showed their, their work on the screen. Again, we didn't need to see their face. Um, the music sessions with Matt were pretty, you know, pretty fun. So again, using sound, it, it lends itself to, to being a, a, a subject which can translate through the screen much more easily. So I think in that cohort, only one young person put their camera on in one session, okay? But again, they spoke out loud towards the end, the, you know, music quizzes, general things like that, especially in the subjects of, of music and art. And if we think about engagement, you know, that was a win, 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 win really for us by the end. OK, so um, we asked the young people, I had made a Google Forms questionnaire and as part of getting feedback for a number of reasons, one, you know, we wanted to somehow quantify impact, but we also wanted to know how we might improve, you know, and what they were getting from this and if these sort of things were working. And we asked them to be totally honest with us. If it wasn't working, tell us that, okay? And, and, and we did get that back. And this 
So the quotes on the left hand side are from uh, taken from the questionnaires on Google and the slide on the right is Mentimeter, which was uh, another one of these uh, interactive typing in programs that Kat was talking about. And we, you know, you, you can see there by their own omission. I have not made up these quotes, 100% have not made up these quotes. It helped with my anxiety, it's helped my confidence. I, I kind of, but I don't think it really helped me at all. I think it made me like online school more. That's fair. You know, that was their experience. Um, it was worthwhile because I got to learn in a surrounding I'm comfortable in. These are clearly, you know, they were, they were uh, okay with being online. Yes, because when I'm doing it, I wouldn't worry or think uh, about the negatives of school and it gave me, a, uh, gave me a break and a good time. And again, the rigor of doing something every day, having to be somewhere and feeling like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, welcome back to the world. Okay, that's what we talk about, capturing them. Okay, we're not doing assessments, we're not, we're capturing an interest. And then, you know, goals. What are the goals for next term? To think more about myself, to go in for a lesson, to go in, to recognize my feelings, start to go in, to go in for lunch or break. And this is really where we were like, okay, we've got something here. Because maybe their ladder is to, to go in for a lunch break. So how do we get there? And that's when we start to think about, right, well, if that's the most anxious, like us, you know, thinking about those manageable steps, where do we begin at the bottom? And how do we make that first step up? And I think just to add on to that, there's a kind of, I think there's a key point here that you can kind of see in, in the students' responses yes the program the initial two weeks is online and for a lot of them they might be thinking well now you know maybe I just could do online school and I don't have to go back to school the way that this program worked was we completely understand how difficult it is for you to go to school we and we want to understand exactly why that is and we we empathize genuinely empathize with how difficult it is for you but that does not mean that we are not going to work on getting you back into school bit by bit engaging with education more whatever that looks like so it's kind of that empathy and that understanding but with the boundaries and that's why we're always thinking about what the goals are what next where are we going next there's always somewhere else to step onto next so it's about having both um both elements of those I think um, so of, of the 10, we've got five responses here. So uh, how would you rate the program? Again, I did not make up these scores from one to 10. And as you can see, um, we've got, you know, three nines, one eight and a four. And again, that four represents where that young person is, or oh, sorry, was at the time. OK, that that is I, knowing who that is. I know that that's a very accurate and honest description of how she, how they felt. And um, I think it's important to put it in there because um, honesty in this is also I'm not taking away their truth or their experience, um, because that means taking away the feeling that I don't recognize that they're struggling and that they, uh, you know, are are are. Um, experiencing a level of distress. I, I have to say this as an aside, this morning I had the pleasure of sitting in a talk with Dr. Tara Porter, who's one of our colleagues in the eating disorder service with over 20 years experience in, in CAMS within London. And one of the things that she was saying about young people is, you know, whether it be eating disorder, wider anxiety, you know, what is the formulation for the distress that this young person is experiencing? OK, and then how is that it, how is that distress being expressed? Because when they get to a point when there's too much distress, the young person will cut off and disengage. OK, and within the realm of, of school attendance and all of the mainstream agendas that we are being asked to follow, OK, uh, and even, even my school, we, you know, attendance, we still have to, we need you in school for you, you know, for you, for your outcomes, for your well-being, etc. But we know that what doesn't work, it doesn't work to be punitive 
with parents to, to enforce punitive measures with fines, etc. But I appreciate that's a system, okay? But if we don't, if we come at this punitively, or, you know, what does it create? It creates an environment between young person, school, and parents of judgment and a feeling of not doing enough and shame and, and, and disengagement in that process. And the road becomes harder for them to get back. And as soon as that path is, has been put, it takes away the, the narrative of what this is all really about. They don't prefer to stay at home in their bedroom in a, in a place of anxiety and, and, and distress. And it will take away from that, that main cause of the distress. And, and, and I say that because this is where we have to reframe the conversation and start to think about the narrative differently. And that's where our role in this with schools is to help them to start to think about that conversation and narrative in a different way by giving them permission to think outside the box and to give parents the okay and the permission as well that it slow it down, take your time and look at the smaller wins because we're getting somewhere here. Okay, I'm going to have to give you a five-minute warning, Gemma. Oh, sorry, Alex. Sorry. Lots okay, and lots so, of, um, I mean, it, to be, I mean, it, it, that kind of summarizes this slide, really. You know, the parental part of this was huge, 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 huge. Um, and, and that's where the follow-up, really, one of the huge successes was they were so happy, to, you know, all the time, so happy that, you know, um, my, my to see them happy again, to see them doing something. They all express not feeling, you know, that I'm not being judged. I am doing enough. I am doing enough. It built trust. And we held them in a space, held them in a space of, of, of their anxieties. Um, and, and they could put it somewhere um, just to listen to them. So here are some parent feedback. Um, I'm not going to read out this more specifically of fan mail to Kat and I, but if you just, you know, take a couple of minutes to have a little skim through what some of the parents said to us. The key thing was that they felt that there were people supporting them and some people that they could talk to, and also, especially Gemma, who they spoke to a lot, but also that, that we were invested in making a plan. So it wasn't just, oh, your child's not going to school, okay, uh, if you can get them in and get them in, it was, well, what are we going to do about it then? We need to do something because they need to be accessing education in some way. So it was, it was, yeah, the agenda, I think, which I think was important. And of course, it was important for parents. Um, so I'm, so generally in sort of since the Links Up programme and at the end of, at the end of our first kind of um, proper cohort, and um, we had some young people who physically went back to their home school. All of them, when we say six out of 10, like Gemma said, there are a few students who didn't start with us at the beginning. So all six of the ones who were part of the program um, were all engaging in some form of education again. Um, most of them were reintegrating back into school or an alternative provision. Um, and actually that yeah and and one young person so we went we supported with the EHCP process and um and working out a new provision for them to go to which they are attending so they all in, in, they all engaged back in in different ways and that's what you, you know with school avoidance that's what you have to sit with that it's all going to be different and it's not going to look the same and that's what can be challenging for schools because schools are held to such high account and standards and I do really appreciate I've seen a couple of comments in the chat and stuff about do we authorize these absences what do we code them as and what do we do with like fines and things like that a lot of schools say that to me and that is really difficult we always just need to come from that place of understanding and that as long as there is a plan and we're working on a plan that's what's important um just a couple of kind of specific examples really of the kind of plans that we put in place because this was what, what we were doing so for example at the top um 
this young person started by going to school on a Monday, picking work up, bringing it home, bringing it back on a Friday. Then she started doing some work physically on the school site on a Wednesday. So it was building it up slowly, slowly. Um, and that kind of, that is a strategy that we, we're using quite a bit with the current cohort of coming in, picking up, dropping off, coming into school to work in the library a little bit. You know, that kind of strategy is quite a good starting point for, for some of them. Um, whereas for some, they don't want to do anything like that. They don't want to appear different. They want to do what everybody else is doing. They just feel that they can't do it. So we need to support them to be able to do stuff that feels to them as normal and typical as possible. And then for some, actually, their attendance just sort of skyrocketed and they were able to go back into school and make friends and um, and really make really make that progress. Now, maintaining that is 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 challenging and what what we had was you know a lot of support around this young person for as long as we were able to provide it for and really what they need is for that homeschool contact and person to keep going with them and keep essentially doing the same thing is this working do we need to do something differently if we need to change it up change it up should we increase the difficulty of it now should we look for something alternative that's going to be better so they need those people with them which I appreciate is a lot for schools to do but that's essentially what they need to kind of keep this going but this was kind of where we got to um so just some sort of conclusions and you know Gemma I'll go through these and then any others from that that you were thinking about we can add into and then I suppose we'll go to questions so it was an online program it offered varied subjects to kind of it the two weeks is to engage young people back into the mindset of learning and then the follow-up work is where we really start to put the plans together um working with an educational psychologist and you know and working with our team to sort of incorporate the psychology element of um into those sessions and into the follow-up work and like we said the follow-up work was crucial and that is and that's exactly what was needed um you know as as Gemma was saying it's not we found that it's not just a program about reintegrating back into school it's about working out what the reasons are and those reasons are really complicated and there may be a huge range of issues. I've seen people kind of put in lots of comments about, you know, children with medical needs, maybe, or um, neurodiversities or, um, you know, really significant mental health difficulties. And really, in all cases, it's about working out, always going back to those push and pull factors. What are the reasons? Why is this happening? What does this young person feel about school? And what intervention can we put around those things? Um so, but also in some cases, the intervention that we put in place offered some signposting to alternative provisions for some, some referrals to specialist services to get some additional help, because also this program will come to an end. So we need to make sure that there's that they've got support around them. Um, and then also using the kind of um the expertise of the Royal Free staff and our service to formulate what was going on for those young people to help us plan the kind of approaches that we used for them. So, you know, like, I've, and I'm, maybe we'll have a lot of questions about kind of specific needs and how we support people with specific needs. Obviously, everybody's reasons are going to be different. Everyone's push and pull factors are different, but the theory we keep is the same. Relationships, psychological safety, graduated return, looking at the push and pull factors, we use that sort of generally in, I'd say in most cases, you know, in most cases so those were the kind of sort of conclusions that we came to from the first cycle of the program Gemma I don't know if you have anything to add and then we'll be able to go to questions no I think you've nailed it Kat thanks okay I'm going to stop sharing and then we can there's obviously quite a lot of questions in here so I'll um how should we do this I, I'll try and guide you through them if that's all right so you two can I be thinking hats on I'll 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 just uh, I'll provide you with the questions. Thanks, um, I think there's quite a lot from people saying, what about neurodiversity? Could it work for this program? Has it worked? Um, specifically later down in the questions about autism. Um, off the top of my head, I couldn't remember if you'd had children with an ASD diagnosis. I think you have. Um, and then any thoughts, I suppose, about the added complication of, of sensory issues and things mm -hmm. to exposure methods, which have been sort of identified later on. Yeah, I'd say in this in this cohort, we also do have a, a few children who have been diagnosed as having autism. And I I think I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done more widely about children with autism and secondary school settings, because 
they are by definition they are big busy loud places um so their push and pull factors again it's the same the push and pull factors just tend to be things maybe that we might be more likely to see with autism so sensory things um or wanting to do things on their terms or wanting to do things a certain way, or I don't like any of those subjects. I only like this one subject. So why do I have to go to all the other subjects, etc.? And I suppose like, I, su- I suppose you still start, you still start from the same place, but you also have to think about what kind of provision is the best, is the best provision for that child that's going to make them the happiest. And that's obviously a huge other question that goes completely, you know, really beyond, beyond the realms of what we're talking about today. But it's a um, it's it's still about thinking about what those factors are and still seeing what we can do around those factors and how flexible the school can be and how inclusive the school are, uh, you know, should be being to include those children in those, um, you know, in in environments that they can cope with better to start yeah. with. You still do the ladder. You still do it in, in the same way. I'm sure and you have that, you know, I'm sure at, at the rule free as well with the students that you're um that you work with yeah no absolutely um there's been quite a lot of questions technical questions obviously you, you touched on it Kat about unauthorized absence I mean from my point of view as a as a head teacher you know I'm often approached by staff saying do I authorize this for a child that's on one of our programs to address emotionally based school avoidance there is no exact science to this and I think you have to operate within the, the guidelines and parameters of your local authority to an extent. If you're an academy, you set your own um, you set your own guidelines. I did hear some mentions of Ofsted. And I, I have to say, um, it's not long since we were done under the new framework. And, I, you know, Ofsted are looking at, at how you address emotionally based school avoidance now, not necessarily how you're recording it. And I think they prefer something to be done than nothing. So I, I think. You know, I, I worry less about B codes or anything else. I should say while they're on this Links Up program, we do temporarily dual register them. We do admit them to the school, so they are B registered um, for the duration of the program. Um, but obviously, the target isn't really to get them ticks in the register; it's to get them a way forward so that they can, you know, there's a longer term way back. Um, somebody also asked about neat uh, children who are not currently anywhere again it would work in theory but obviously you need an agreed outcome of where it's going to go to because if it's just to go back to what they were doing it doesn't work um and there are again some things about what kinds of young people and i'm just trying to quickly answer as many of these as possible there has to be some motivation to change and this was something that was touched on today Gemma talks about this talk that some of us went to today there's got to be some motivation to change and some agency to do it uh, that could come with a whole range of different needs but there has to be that motivation to to move forward, um, something to work with at the start. Um, let me just scroll through and see where else. Um, Alex, can I can I just add to the yeah. point about young people with ASD? It, it just like I said in this new cohort we've of linked up, we've just finished the online program, and we, as we said, we have two young people. Um, one one with ASD diagnosis, formally assessed by the um, CAMS, and they are they engaged for two days on the screen, and we didn't see them again. Now you know we weren't huge alarm bells because I know that the nature of the program means that the follow up work with this young person is going to be absolutely vital. So. Is thinking about how he makes sense of the world, of his world and his home life and those protective factors, interests, drawing on the pulling factors that may engage them back to, to and then thinking what more widely, what specialist medical services, whether it be autistic specific, you know, could there be via referral that way to, to, to investigate and do a bit of digging on? Are there any resources within the school already that could be supportive? And ultimately, after, you know, if we get to the end of the 17 weeks and it's something there hasn't necessarily been a shift because again it's not just in school there's a wider how is this young person managing with family life and 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 the world in which they're living in which has become quite isolated because of the nature of the the routines and the rituals that they are now sort of um uh, following so we're looking wider to establish a team around that young person but absolutely that signposting is important and it and it may have a shift I mean I'm you know ask me in 
15 weeks time and I will let you know. But again, I didn't say no to any referrals because I thought, you know, let's see if this could work. A lot, there, there, there are a number of questions about um, you know, how do children access it? How accessible is it? Um, what's the ethos that you try to create? Well, you know, we do have quite a strong ethos as a school. You can look at our website and hopefully it will come through. You know, I, I, I'm happy to talk to, to to people. I'm always happy to talk about, you know, what we do at the Royal Free. And it has expanded significantly over the last four or five years. We talk about a challenge model, but really what Gemma and Kat are doing and, and what we tried to do with all our programmes, and that that's from the alternative provision programmes, is there's an aspirational quality about it, which feels really counterintuitive. You're taking quite hopeless uh, children with quite hopeless feelings, and you're basically saying there's a chance for you to step up to something now. And it, it's quite a trick to pull, but it can be done. And there's certainly we've got a we've got a program on um, on Finchley Road in North London where sort of 16 young people all have missed over you know 18 months, two years of school. But once they're there, there's an aspirational quality that they've earned their place there because they're ready to change. And I think it's 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 giving them a sense that there is a way forward. And that's the ethos side of it. And to be honest, that you need the right staff. You need you need to have talent. You need to have somebody that's going to be able to sell that to children, make them feel secure and held enough that they can make those changes. And I, I don't do that work. That's, that's the work that, that Gemma and Kat and all the teachers on the programmes do. But I think you do need that. And yes, lots of questions about is this available in Northern Ireland and internet. As far as we know, this type of online mixture intervention is quite new. It's something that we've been doing. It, we, we generally only accept referrals from the London Borough of Camden because we're so oversubscribed. However, if you want to get in touch, I've put the admin at royalfree.camden.sch.uk address. You can get in touch with the school through there. And I'll, you know, we'll answer as many of those questions uh, as you have. Um, I think um, somebody mentioned, and it's hopefully kind of cover things, you know, a few other things that this kind of approach and what we're talking about today links quite, quite closely with trauma-informed practices. And yeah. yes, you're absolutely right. So... And um, one of the other things that I do a lot of work on and that we do a lot of work on, you know, you do at school uh, is, the, is the trauma informed work. Um, and essentially, that's the practice of empathy, understanding, trying to work out the reasons why, 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 why is this happening? How can we respond rather than, you know, using that punitive approach, but still having those boundaries and still saying well, we're going to do something, we need to do something about this. And that's exactly what that approach is. And that's exactly what this is. It's about kind of, um, yeah, it's I think so. I've seen somebody say like holistic approach to understanding. And that's exactly what it is. And that takes and that does take time. Yeah, um, we're not going into this thinking that we're going to have 100% attendance return rate and that it's going to remain, you know, we're aware that we're going to go up, we're going to go down, we, you know, we might have a, re we might go back in. And that's the nature, that's the nature of, of, of that underlying what's the distress about. And, and it's how it's reframing that in your mind. So a lot of conversations I'm having with parents is about, yeah, but they went in for an hour and a half. So they didn't do the rest, but they went in for an hour and a half. They've not done that. And when there's more kind of sort of, you know, rigor of more and more of those, it's reframing with them because they're so used to feeling and being, you know, it's not enough, we need more, you know. So it's having the permission from your school leaders, from your, you know, from your, um, and, and having these conversations about thinking about a school return in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I completely understand, um, you know, questions about what if what if what if children aren't motivated? I think we've got to presume as professionals, we've got to have that. We've got to be the optimistic ones. So you've got to think that children are trying to solve problems in the way they're behaving and whether that's acting in, acting out. Uh, they're always trying to solve a problem. And we've got to remain optimistic on their behalf that given the right set of circumstances, something gets kindled, you can move forward with it. That is our that is our experience at the at the Royal Free Hospital Children's School over the last four or five years, despite COVID, that young people can 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 make can turn really rapid corners, especially around things like school avoidance, and that body language changes very quickly, and you know they get back to themselves, they they feel better, and they get hopeful again, um, it, you know, and it can happen, but you know it it it, it can feel very tough, depression very tough, you know, very tough to deal with. Um, 
I think that is something that, you know, from the feedback from this program and also the work that you do is about like creating a sense of hope. And that is what we need for sort of our psychological well-being. And I think that's something that came out quite a lot in the feedback from parents and the conversations we have with parents. It made them feel that it's, you know, and something I say quite a lot when I'm talking to parents and to children as well of, you know, I can see it. This is this is going to get better. This is we're not going to be here forever. There's there's something that we can do. There's a step that we can take. And it's seeing that there is something that you can aim for. And it's not just going to be it's not just going to stay the way it is, you know, forever and ever. And that's a really I think that's a really powerful thing for people to grasp onto, especially when, you know, this is challenging to deal with for schools and parents and children. It's a hard thing to manage. Yeah, absolutely. Um... And they're not forgotten. That's really important, you know? That's really important. They don't feel forgotten. Someone's checking in on them all of the time and they're calling back. And, and that's where the commitment from all or everybody involved is really important. Yeah. Okay, some really kind comments in the, uh, in the yeah. chat. We really appreciate them. Um, you know, really appreciate, as I said, if you do want to get in touch, don't bombard us because you know, get and there's quite a lot of you here today. But if you do want to get in touch, please use the admin at royalfree.cam.sch.uk. And you know, where appropriate, I would direct on to Kat or Gemma um, as professional contacts. I think I would say, however, that with specific cases, you know, we really are, you know, kind of slightly confined to the London borough of Camden. And although I hugely sympathize with different things that are going on. I'm not really able to provide or I'm going to have the capacity to provide individual advice and guidance on cases, um, you know, uh, outside at the moment. Um, but outside that, with other professionals, if you are looking at you do have specific interest in the program um, or how it might work, then get in touch through the email address. I'm happy to explore how we might be able to extend it. We are potentially looking at two directions, which is to look to extend it to an out of borough offer initially and then to potentially look at something around primary school children because we are seeing school avoidance in our outreach service um, in that target group and um, potentially I think it could be extended that way. Um, any final thoughts Kat and Gemma? Just to say you know I think that there's scope to sort of pass on this model and knowledge to yourselves you know we're in the middle of a cycle currently there should be another cycle in that our summer term mm -hmm. if 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 there is potential scope for for yourselves who might want to come and shadow how the program runs to watch and sit through the process to then be able to disseminate that onto how you might run that yourself within your own um you know local authority uh or you know wider nationally um i'm absolutely happy to try and support projects like that yeah we're not looking at sitting on this it's um this, this is not a secret you no know, it's not a secret no and, and as i say it, it is on our website uh, the information I, I shared some of the links but you can find the stuff about EBSA. you can find or there's a whole section for schools on our website which is freely available to anybody anywhere Thanks, okay uh, Thanks for joining us, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so for your much. lovely comments. It's very kind of you. Yeah, thank you very much. Find out more about becoming an ACAM member and to be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health. Visit www.acamh.org.